We want to make sure we capture all of this. Excellent. Thank you. So I think it is 11.01, Anuprita, uh, we can start, I guess. We can start now? Okay. So good morning, everyone. And I'm sure for some people it's early morning or travel, like it's late night. But thank you so much for really sparing your uh, uncomfortable timing also to share, this, share this, uh, your knowledge, what you have uh, learned over a period of time with all of us. So thanks on behalf of the list people to join us uh, at a different time or, or, or time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, all the participants to, to join. We know as a new day, it's 11 o'clock, it's a busy, busy time, but uh, when we have consistent, I'm sure we are trying to at least some, add some value to it. So let me just take a couple of minutes to just introduce about uh, the elite CISO and just uh, maybe a lot of people who are uh, you know, joining repeatedly for them. It's, it's a retreat, but please request you to bear with us. Uh, for some time, uh, because for newcomers it will be good to, uh, you know, um, to really walk them to uh, the website what we have. Yeah, so just give me a minute and just share the screen. So, uh, okay, I mean, uh, most of us participants they know the background about the LXCO, LXCO is a community. Uh, the, the objective was to collaborate between the CISOs and the CIOs and not only CISOs because CIOs and CISOs both has to work together hand in hand and that is how we found the group. Again this is a senior, senior level group where we have a knowledge sharing and it's a very close community group which we have formed uh, to at least you know have a knowledge sharing and also, you know, uh, in a closed group, also feel free to share and take the guidance from each other. So that is how the group is formed. I will just take, uh, you know, a couple of minutes just to brief about uh, all the things that we have. So we have started, I think, last last year, uh, in October, either September or October 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2018. So it's almost one and a half year or almost two years we'll be completing. We have. Uh, so I'll, I'll just take you about, so uh, we, we started, as I mentioned, we started in uh, the uh, one and a half year back. So we have, so let me tell you the, the team structure. So we have uh, four of us, because Trishi, myself and Paul, we started considering how do we increase the collaboration between white and guys uh, while black and guys are coordinating these things. So those of four of us, we started and we created multiple chapters. We have chapters in Delhi, Mumbai, Pune, Ahmedabad, uh, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Chennai, and Dubai. Okay, some of the chapters are very active and some of the chapters are still picking up, but it is also, as I mentioned, it's a, a community group. We request everybody to actively participate and make this as a very close group where we all feel free to take help from each other, right? So uh, again, if you go here everywhere, you will see what are the chapter leads, okay? Uh, so this is how you can browse to and communicate to anybody, you know, whoever you feel that you like to be added into a, into a particular local chapter group and, you know, uh, be an active participant. So that is what we have multiple chapters. Uh, another thing is that recently we have started uh, the registration because uh, you know we need to know the people with whom we are interacting and also from the PDQ perspective, eventually it will be, it will become very critical for all of us to have the personal detail of everyone. So request you to go to the sign up uh, sign up page and register here. Even in your local chapters, we are communicating the form. So request you to fill up the form and give it to us. And this will also help us eventually to communicate on the latest developments that are happening. And you also become a close uh, you know, member who are interacting with the closed group. So uh, request whoever has done it, please ignore it. But whoever has not done it, request you to go and register it. Yeah. Because eventually with all the registered, we will be having a common group also who as of now, we are having an interaction within the local chapter, but we will be having, we will be creating a global group across all the chapters and make it a collaborative platform, single platform. 
uh, another thing is that almost every week we are doing a lot of things and as of now we were as i mentioned we were working in a uh, local group but covid has really taught us although lockdown and all other things are a lot of discomfort but has really uh, you know made us to learn about you know expanding our boundaries and interact with i uh, uh, have a boundary like working in a environment so with these things we are having a lot of events and if you see there are a lot of communications that are happening about the events so and and again the beauty is that we have multiple events with multiple uh, multiple topics in the front partner level at cto level there are a lot of people who have taken initiative and come back and have uh, you know recorded podcast on particular topic about uh, the topic where they are the sme of it and they can share the knowledge so please uh, you can go to the past events and there are a lot of recorded events what you have whenever you want to access anything you can go here and, uh, and listen so this is not only the webinar where you attend the webinar and if you miss then you are going to miss even if you miss please go to the past events and uh, you know uh, access all this uh, recorded uh, videos another thing is as i mentioned we have multiple uh, events which are coming out so go to our upcoming uh, event page the today is we are having neel and uh, chahak as as uh, as a speaker and i'll introduce them a little later but uh, there are more events also which are coming up like uh, there is an event on the next thursday uh, so which is on the on the checkpoint side so that you access it and also there is a there is a charter which we have mentioned the schedule which we have we have published um, so that you can go and block your days accordingly because in work from home i understand work from home you reduce the travel time but obviously you end up working very late but you can plan your schedule according to to the schedule what we have discussed and also you can choose what topic for you are attend again we are not only on the knowledge sharing part it is a very diversified group and lot of people like almost almost 50 people are part of our other social group for example uh, the cso fitness community so i mean because is uh, our our uh, personal brand for the fitness and the kind of energy what he has and the way he uh, he really drives everybody to the fitness and the kind of really what we have got to feedback is a lot of people they say that when they were not able to even walk little you know now they have started like 5 km every day kind of thing so those are uh, the feedback for we already have it uh, yeah i don't say that but i think vikas is a good brand for for elite to so to drive the fitness part uh, another critical topic for women in cyber security we know that it's a it's a worldwide topic where we talk about women in cyber security so we are trying to drive it and there are a lot of female uh, leaders who has taken initiative and joined us to drive this request i mean among all the participants who are interested please contact any one of us and we will clear so all what i personally feel that we really work professionally for a long time but uh, now at this age when we have reached to a certain level i feel we have given back to society that how we develop the community how we develop the next generation that we have and then we also have cyber security awareness for kids because i personally feel that kids are like very vulnerable and we should be alone we have a lot to do and we have not really done much what we really aspire to it and again i think personally that personally we aspire to do a lot of things but we have not done it but we are going to do it that is in our vada another thing is what i mentioned is like we have special mentoring and this sunday we are having webinar where uh, from iim we are speaking to we will talk about uh, the mentoring and building the cyber security Uh, uh career uh, i mean after the bs so this is for the session we have whatever in your personal network or your professional network if you feel that somebody can attend that might be a direction uh, to the pressure where they really get lost in their go for coding with the go for data analytics or whether to go for cyber security and i think cyber security is one of the uh, you know critical area which has to be developed and which is going to have you know lot of demand even in next five to 10 years so we request all the participants to propagate 
so that you know we guide the pressure mind where they have a lot of energy and they have they we need to give them a direction in building their own career then there are other things for example uh, the training part we are having two training cssp training so maybe my morning discussion with with vikas was that whether cssp shall be with, with cio level or not but i mean he is already running my batch and there are a lot of cios are coming picture and uh, cios are attending it and we fully believe that you know cs should also be a part of it even if there are batch junior level to find but i, I feel these webinars and these uh, weekend sessions will definitely help so we have sessions on cisc and is 27001 which are like the basic basic things for our uh, you know cyber security community then there are earlier trainings also there are recordings available so whoever is interested can go and and, and uh, go through the the workshop so that is what we have Okay, another thing is that podcast almost every week we are having multiple podcasts uh, on, on different different topics. Uh, so here we have industry level people, you know, some experts who has, who has come uh, uh, to come forward to talk about a particular topic, whatever, whether it is related to technology, whether it is related on the software side, or maybe different uh, what to do from work or during work from home situation part of you. So you can really go to webinars, you can go to podcasts, you can go to trainings, and this is what we are trying to drive. So uh, I think I've been a lot of time, but I think this is important. Uh, so today's uh, speakers, we have two esteemed speakers to talk about today for on the topic. Uh, so Neil, Neil is uh, the, the CTO at Netco. I mean, just to give you a background, Neil is having 20 years of experience, and uh, he is is a CTO uh, at EMEA. He works alongside product and uh, the engineering team to ensure the security delivery of Netco technology and services. Uh, so Neil, Neil is also having a better, I mean, is the experience in the banking side. So Neil has worked with Swissri, Jasher Bank, Tumblr Group, and, and Post Point. So he's having a hybrid experience within the industry as well as on the product side. So I'm sure Neil will have a lot to do on or share knowledge with us on, on both the sides. Neil is also co-founder and board member of Security Advisory Alliance, uh, a non-profit organization. And uh, he, he works with them in building, uh, I mean, he has a role to promote information security and other security career in the future. So welcome Neil. Uh, Neil is also on the advisory board of Cloud Security Alliance, uh, EMEA, and member of uh, European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, where he contributes a lot on, on different, different topics. Uh, then Neil is also on other part, but I think, uh, yeah, the neurocyber and supporting on this. Group. Another uh, speaker is Chahat. So, yeah, Chahar is going to talk about a lot about the personal branding and I think being the CISO and who is a face to a cyber security for the board, for the outsiders, for all the businesses. I think in CISO's life, it's very, very important to build, build, the, build the personal brand. And, and I'm sure uh, once you build a personal brand, uh, it, it helps you to communicate a lot uh, within our internal stakeholders as well as the regulator and so many other stakeholders. So just a brief about the Chahat. Chahat is an author for uh, Trial Global, an American company that provides behavior change technology founded by, by Ariana Huffington. She is a growth partner for Rebel Studios, the women-run design agency in Poland. She was the head of global brand for Oyo Vacation Home and was an integral part in growing the Oyo brand from $250 million to uh, you know, $10 million. She is also the founder of ImpactStudyBiz.com, a strategic consulting consultancy that provides growth marketing, business strategy, and education to startups and SMEs. The company's sole mission is to create the positive impact to, the, to this world by helping brands make their full potential. Chahat has been a uh, short film director, writer, trainer, designer, uh, management consult consultant, branding expert, uh, marketer, strategist. She has climbed in the Himalayas, dived in the uh, 
Great Barrier Reef and lives on three continents. He has keen interest in human psychology, history of the world culture, art and philosophy. Uh, so, Chahad, I think, uh, I mean, when I see, I think you have so much diversified profile, I really wonder how do you make time for so many things. So, um, I'm personally a, a, your fan and I, I would be very interested to really hear you. So, Neil, over to you uh, to share the knowledge of what you feel that you have been over a period of time and, you know, help us to increase our knowledge systems. So, over to you, Neil. Great. So thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, I'm sorry the, the if I missed out something in your introduction, but it was a, it was a big introduction. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's but okay. No problem. It. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction um, and welcome to everybody uh, for today's uh, for today's webinar. So um, my thanks to Elite CISO for, for hosting uh, today's session. Um, so my name is Neil Thacker. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for, for Netscope. Many of you may know Netscope as, the, uh, as a cloud security company, protecting thousands of organizations across the globe uh, with their threat protection and data protection programs uh, for the cloud. So today I'm gonna to be talking about a, um, a gateway to a better life. Um, so we've been, uh, I guess everyone has had a pretty tough time over the last uh, few months. Um, what we're looking at is of course, looking to the future and looking at how we can kind of improve uh, our organizations um, through many, many transformation programs. So digital transformation, general business transformation, but of course also network and security transformation. Uh, and, and those things are key as, as organizations uh, grow, as we innovate, as we bring new products and services uh, to the market for consumers and for people across the globe. So from my, from my perspective, it's thinking about how we also need to change from a uh, from a from an information security perspective. So again, I've been involved now in information security for 20 years. I've been really specialising in cloud and data protection for the last 10 years. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking about some kind of uh, some stories, some successes, and some new ways of, of thinking about that. But ultimately, um, how we can use best practice to enable our workforce to really harness their collaborative and innovation uh, abilities. So I'm going to start off with, a, again, a, a very high level slide that talks about how most organizations have transformed over the uh, even the last few years. So yesterday, we think about the last 20 years, uh, most organizations have had this perimeter, had all their data, uh, most of their people working from within inside that perimeter, where of course, we now look to today and everybody is now dispersed because of the, the, the current crisis. What we're also seeing is there has been a lead up to that. I mean, there are more and more people working remotely even before this crisis hit. And if we look at the predictions, um, the future of the workforce is of course, with freedom and flexibility in mind. Uh, most organizations, most employers are highlighting that they're giving their employees more flexibility um, and also giving them access to some kind of innovative type services, uh, typically that, that are hosted in the cloud. Um, and when we talk about cloud, we can talk about many areas of cloud. So SaaS, IaaS, PaaS, so software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, everything today is as a service. But what happens is it becomes uh, quite complex for the networking and information security teams to try to manage and try to apply controls. And of course, we also know that there are threats out there today, uh, threats that typically utilize cloud uh, also to gain an advantage and gain access to organizations uh, kind of critical data. So again, we need to th start thinking about this, how we, how we allow for our employ employees uh, to work collaboratively with the tools that they want to use, uh, but also make sure that we protect them from those uh, threats. So I'm gonna start off with a, uh, again, a great study. Uh, this was a study by Deloitte looking at millennial and, and, gener and generation Z's. So thinking about how typically they are optimistic about the future. Uh, and of course, this was um, pre-COVID-19. This was around the end of 2019. But it's a really interesting study identifying, um, it's, 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 uh, it's been used as a, um, a metric established as a, as a mood monitor for millennial and Generation Z. Uh, typically, um, people coming into the workforce and how they kind of foresee the future. 
And the great thing is when we look at this by country, we can see that there are some countries where people are really optimistic about the future. Uh, they're really optimistic around, um, uh, again, business impact and environmental optimism and even thinking, thinking about personal finance and the social and political aspects of these things. Um, there's lots of people now that are, are, are being optimistic about the future. And again, this is why I hope that we will all be in, in future years. Um, because of this, there's also thinking about how this relates back to kind of industry. And we all know that we're in the kind of fourth industrial revolution. We're in that phase of digital transformation. We're seeing more and more organizations look to digital to support their future, to, to bring in, um, again, a, a, a new number of workers, um, increasing their headcount, even looking at things such as the gig economy to better support uh, their organization. So more freelance and, and more um, people working on specific projects that are specialist and have high skill sets in those areas. Things such as, again, automation and machine learning and looking at big data and how we typically use that data in real time. So this is the, the really interesting thing of this report highlights that the optimism is there. But again, it also highlights that people will want to work in a new way to take advantage of all of these opportunities. So if I now think about this, all the ways that we typically work uh, and have worked over the, uh, the last I know, 50, 60, 70 years, we know that um, if I go back to my first job, I was based in an office. Um, I, was, I was given a laptop about two to three years into my, my job. Before that, I had a desktop uh, computer. and I was given a laptop in around 2002 uh, and also get, given a, you, you were pretty lucky if you were given, given a laptop. Um, you were even lucky if you were given a, a gold card modem that allowed you to connect to the internet and sync your email. Uh, many of you may, of course, re remember that. And I remember also getting my first tri-band uh, phone, a Nokia 6310, a corporate device that I can now also uh, use uh, to make calls when I'm, I'm traveling, working remote uh, and those things. And then also over that period of time, um, I then got my first BlackBerry, uh, which was, again, an amazing way that I can now stay in contact and, and collaborate with people, primarily using email. Um, but of course, that quickly, that quickly evolved. And if I think about the last 10 years, um, now most organizations will say, well, by default, we're going to issue you a laptop. Uh, you don't have to be an executive to get, a, uh, to get access to again, the services and the data that you need to do your, to do your day, day job, right? It's almost a given, of course. Um, so we, we think about this and we think about how people have been given these devices and actually in many organizations, they're actually asking employees, please choose your device, choose a device that, that works for you. Um, and it could be, a, again, a, a myriad of devices. Perhaps it could be a, a Chromebook or perhaps it could be a, a Mac. So we see a lot of organizations moving away from that kind of traditional Windows laptop. But of course, we're also being, um, all, uh, employees are being asked again, do you need a, a traditional device, um, perhaps would an iPad be sufficient for you in terms of your work? So we're seeing this kind of change in terms of how devices are being um, and, uh, again, typically procured and then being given to, uh, to employees. And we've also seen this big rise of, again, bring your own device. So even employees saying, look, I'd much rather use my own device. I'd much rather just have one device for all my activities. And again, organizations embracing that because again, there's also, um, again, benefits to them by, by doing that. But it's not just the device, it's of course, it's where we work. Um, and of course, we know that em employees, even over the last few years, uh, have taken this approach that they just want to work anywhere. And also at any, any point in time, perhaps, um, again, going to the nearest coffee shop, um, sitting down, working on a, perhaps a presentation, perhaps even in, a, in an airport. Um, of course, that's not so, uh, that's not possible so much right now. But we know that again, for employees, um, that will be a, con uh, a continued requirement uh, in future years. So just having that freedom and flexibility to work anywhere. Um, now, of course, there are some people that would take their laptop to the beach and perhaps work on important documents and even, even on their, their kind of their PTO, their paid time off, perhaps we'll need to be checking and keeping up to date with things. We also need to think about that. Um, now for me, not my biggest preference to take a laptop to a beach, but again, this also embraces this, this kind of work anywhere at any point in time. Um, even going down to the point of, again, we know that a lot of people right now are working from home. We know that some organizations have been quite badly affected because they weren't able to quickly scale and support people working from home. But again, I think as we think about future uh, opportunities, 
just thinking about all of these environments where we work from uh, will be key. If I start thinking about this from a, again, a, a building a kind of diagram around what this looks like, this is typically what we see. So we have remote offices, we have offices, our headquarters, and we have our, our mobile users. Uh, and they could all be the same, same person. I know for, for most people um, commuting into the office, um, you could be working on, on, on your device, catching up with work, perhaps even creating a presentation. Um, if you're fully remote, again, in that, in that case, you're user, utilizing services, you're collaborating with your employees that are based in the office. Um, and this thing kind of continues right, as we start building out more collaboration and connectivity options as we build a better interconnected world. The key aspect is, is that for most organizations, they're also moving their data to the cloud. Um, and this could be through um, looking at applications and refactoring applications that are going to be cloud ready. It can also be utilizing um, SaaS, more and more SaaS services. We see the average organization using well over a thousand SaaS services. Uh, we also have infrastructure moving to the cloud. So people moving away from a traditional data center where they're building their, again, they're, they're installing servers and they're installing their applications there to, um, again, choosing a, a kind of a virtualized option and moving to things such as AWS, Azure, and GCP. So this is where we're seeing this, this challenge really. Again, our, our data and our employees have dispersed. There's no longer that perimeter. And what we're seeing is, again, a big growth in, in the use of these services. And again, employees that don't typically want to connect back in through those tr uh, traditional methods. So this is an example of that traditional method. Again, a remote worker wanting to access websites and cloud applications. Um, how this happens, of course, today for, for a lot of organizations. Well, they'll, they'll say, look, if you want to access these services, we have to connect you securely. We also may need to uh, ensure that we're applying threat protection and data protection to that traffic. So we're gonna have to ask you to VPN back in. We'll then connect you through to a secure gateway, and then we'll route you back out to the internet. Now, for some organizations, um, again, they're seeing obviously pushback on this because for a remote worker, this adds huge layers of latency. Um, connecting everyone back into a, a data center uh, is also a, not a good thing when everybody is, is remote. So what we're seeing is this change as, as organizations start thinking about this. Is this the right approach? Um, I, am I thinking about the employee? Am I thinking about the, uh, again, my networking capability and my capacity and how I can scale as I bring on more and more people and I'm using more and more cloud services? Is this the kind of the right way that, and the right approach? So we've seen this change over, over a period of time. And even if I think back to how we've evolved, we kind of started off with perhaps web 1.0 where we had just really static web pages. Uh, and the only control we needed to put in was to just basically block inappropriate content. Um, we then moved to kind of um, web 2.0 where we had more um, again, user generated content. Um, and then we need to think about, well, how do we apply threat protection? Because we now saw a rise in the number of kind of drive-by attacks and, and websites that were serving up malicious code. So again, when we're thinking about two, uh, Web 2.0, we also had the introduction of more cloud traffic and more SaaS-based applications. So we needed to think about how we uh, better protect those. And that was based on typically a category. Um, moving to Web 3.0, we, we now saw again a jump up about 30% of enterprise cloud traffic, sorry, of enterprise traffic was going to cloud. So between those years, 2013 and 2017, that's where we saw, again, uh, this, this kind of big jump from 10% to 30% of, of traffic going to cloud. And that's where we needed to also then offer that, that, that scalability and looking at more things such as, again, performing SSL or TLS inspection at scale because that wasn't something we could typically do with an appliance that sat on premise. Ultimately, to the point where we are now, where we're in the stage where we're in kind of a, from a secure web gateway perspective, or we're in a 4.0 in terms of its evolution, where we're seeing up to 85% of that enterprise traffic going to cloud. And when we start thinking about more application traffic than traditional web traffic, we need to think about access control, how we're giving access to those applications and who should be accessing those applications. And are we protecting them? Again, are we thinking about what data goes to those apps? How do we actually manage and perform due diligence around third party risk? How do we even have visibility? Uh, a common question I ask to um, peers of mine, other CISOs in other organizations is how many cloud applications are you using? Uh, I don't always, uh, they don't have always have the right answer. 
Um, and in many cases, it's, it's, it's well underestimated in terms of how many applications they're using in their organization. So those are the kind of things we need to start thinking about as we build out and focus on that secure gateway, that fourth uh, uh, evolution of, of that uh, security capability. So if I think about this, how this looks, this is just one example. This is how, for instance, Netscope works that we would connect a remote worker to the Netscope security cloud um, and would give access to websites, to cloud applications, even back into uh, and enable employees access to public cloud um, and even back into these on-prem legacy applications. For instance, you may have applications that can't be refactored to cloud or that are due to go end of life in the next few years. And there's no, there's, it's not a, a cost effective option to perform that type of uh, transition to the cloud. So there's ways of doing that, moving away from things such as um, uh, you know, VPN concentrators to using things such as a zero trust network access and using publishers uh, in this uh, respect. And also from a, the great thing is from an employee perspective, they don't need to choose which connectivity option they have. Everything is enabled by default. And of course, what you actually see is when you're connecting to cloud via a cloud, you also have that uh, capability of looking at the, uh, again, the opportunities of things such as direct peering with these cloud services, which actually, of course, increases performance uh, while also adding those layers of security. So we need to th start thinking about uh, this kind of evolution to 4.0, thinking about the services and again, uh, content that we're consuming um, as, as employees for our organizations and just thinking about again, how, we, how we're seeing the kind of the biggest shift more to cloud. And this is where things such as a next generation secure gateway uh, may be relevant to you and your organizations to ensure that you are applying that layer of protection um, in the right place. I always refer to this as, um, again, thinking about this as putting the control, moving the control to the path of that traffic, rather than having to redirect that traffic to the control. It's, it's just a much more viable option. Uh, and again, it increases employee happiness around how they're connecting um, and just providing again that gateway to a to a better life so if i now start thinking about this we where we start building these things out there's many ways that we can do this and what we've seen over a period of time is is organizations thinking about this and thinking well, what kind of technology do i need what kind of security controls and networking capabilities do i need to provide that type of service so for many organizations, they've looked at things such as CASB, where there's been, a, again, a, a, a focus looking at how they secure access to, again, these managed applications in the cloud. Uh, and even looking at how they do this with a, again, looking at services that they don't manage, perhaps, again, shadow IT type services, where there is no um, appetite to really start managing those services, but they are going to be used and, and needed by the organization, even thinking about applications that are being used by your business partners and your supply chain that you don't ultimately manage, but your employees may need access to. So those are the kind of things you start thinking about when you start thinking about, a, again, a CASB, a cloud access security broker, and giving all of these connectivity options to your employees from unmanaged devices, as well as from managed devices as well. Also, when we start thinking about this, again, this is where we start thinking about, well, how do we then introduce that secure gateway that, that manages access to the websites and the web content out there today? What we're seeing is this uh, consolidation of both CASB and secure gateway um, and thinking about these capabilities that we do need uh, moving forward and things such as more than just HTTPS, SSL, TLS inspection. It's also thinking about how these applications are being coded. Many use APIs, many use uh, JSON, um, and for an organization to get true visibility into those capabilities, it's a case of you need to decode HTTPS, API, and JSON. So we also then think about how we protect those applications. So um, again, just, just steering our employees to these and providing uh, access control, threat protection, and data protection is great. But what happens about the data that's already in these applications? And that's where we can start thinking about, well, how do we connect through APIs? Uh, and actually perform levels of API enabled protection, uh, including things such as checking for secure configuration. Uh, we've seen a big, big um, rise in the number of misconfigured uh, containers. So for instance, AWS, GCP, and Azure. There's currently hundreds and thousands of these um, instances out there that are not uh, appropriately secured and can be accessed by anybody 
on the internet. There's even some websites that you can go to that will give you a list of currently unsecured services. So we also need to think about how we better secure public cloud security. And then finally, again, that those legacy on-prem applications that we still need to secure, we need to start thinking about how we do that uh, and moving away from traditional IP to IP connectivity. Uh, VPNs, I think, pretty much have, have, have had their time. They were, they, were, they were a great introduction when we had those laptops, when we had those gold card modems, when we had that connectivity option to connect back into our network. But what we're seeing now is that more and more organizations want to move to a more application-centric uh, form of authentication and using things more than just, a again, a, an approved um, VPN client that installs uh, on, the, on the endpoint, but thinking about how they use a multitude of authentication mechanisms. So again, not just the employee, but the device, uh, the location that they're connecting from. Thinking about, again, how they actually uh, look for compromised devices that are connecting in through a VPN. That's a, a, real, a real common requirement that, we, that we're seeing right now is that organizations uh, where employees are remote, um, if unfortunately they are compromised, um, what can happen is that, give, that gives that, um, the attacker the direct access to their network when in fact, what they're looking to do is move away from that into more focused areas of zero trust network access where they can actually limit uh, the attack surface and the potential exposure. So those, those are just some ways of, of looking at these things and thinking about this as a kind of a blueprint. Um, again, thinking about, again, uh, the future, thinking about how we evolve and innovate and how we can best uh, support our employees uh, over the next few years. So thank you. With, uh, with my time uh, pre coming up uh, pretty quickly, um, that we do probably have one or two uh, minutes for questions. Um, so I can, I can see those questions coming in right now. So I'll quickly uh, go through and, and take those. Um, so the first question is, is container configuration checking part of Netscope's public cloud uh, security solution? So yes, today, so currently we, we focus heavily on IaaS, so protecting AWS, Azure, GCP from a, a public cloud perspective. And we are doing more and more work with also checking for containers uh, and also those the application stack that typically runs uh, within those containers. Um, and next question is around, does Netscape support Linux endpoints? Uh, we currently have something that we have uh, Linux support on our roadmap, um, and that will be something that will be uh, coming uh, very soon uh, to you as well. Uh, one more question before I hand over is, um, does Netscape work as a cloud-based firewall IPS content filtering? So yesterday, we currently have a secure, uh, secure gateway capability, our next-gen secure gateway capability with CASB and also perform those APIs. Um, and again, um, in the near future, in the very near future, because we're based on microservices, uh, there will be those options to include firewall IPS uh, moving forward. But today, yes, we, we include content filtering, secure gateway, cloud access security broker, and API connectivity to public clouds. Great, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening today. If you have any further questions, my email address is uh, on the screen, a really easy email address to remember. It's uh, nthacker at netscope.com. So thank you once again, and I'll hand over to uh, Chad for the rest of today's uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Neil. I think it was wonderful. Uh, just to summarize what you spoke about is that, you know, uh, so as of now, we were talking about the data center, which is boundary lace, uh, but now, and again, in work from home situation, people are boundary lace. And eventually, the, the, the best way what you represented was that people, data, and systems all are dispersed. Now, when everything is dispersed, and at the time, uh, at the same time, CISOs are expected to provide or assure the data security and which all regulators and all the management uh, is expecting from us that this is where the zero trust come in picture. And also another takeaway what I took and which uh, I think was, was very good, which I personally felt is your differentiation between web, web 2.0, 3.0 and 4.0 where 85% of the uh, you know companies are going to adopt the cloud because of elasticity and because of flexibility. And that is where cloud service brokers will, will come in. I mean, are going to uh, be more adopted. And another thing what, what you spoke about and which I took it up as a takeaway is 
the integration of cloud security gateway and web access gateway. So that is going to be the next feature as, as you spoke about this. So I think it was very, very, and another point, one more point, what I noted is that API enabled the protection and the assessment part of it. I, and as of now, the API integration has started, but API integration is at little, uh, little, get to match your stage and i think there is there is a lot of scope in you know api security assessment part as well as the the protection part so thank you so much i think it was quite a uh, eye opening session to plan for the cso's to plan ahead and instead of being a reactive so i think uh, we have good takeaways which which will help us to define the roadmap thank you so much so uh, Coming back to the next uh, Chahad session, which is which is really really exciting session. Being a CISO, we talk at multiple places, and you know we represent inside, we represent outside, and the objective is that that is the only one phase where you know the whole management is looking forward to have the assurance part of it. So it's very important to build the the personal brand and although from marketing side little bit of knowledge what i have is like you know people in us like celebrities uh, like rehana amitabh bachchan those guys are like personal brand like shahrukh khan modi is the best example who is who is the personal brand who has created really worldwide brand and for CISOs also it's very very important to build that transfer brand because they are representing anywhere so chahit over to you look forward to really you know uh, you know charge up ourselves to build our personal brand also take some tricks from you because you have wide experience uh, on building different brands also and when you said growth marketing i think that is where at individual growth marketing will help all of us over to you chahit Thank you, Anupriya, and thank you, because for arranging this session. And Neil, it was an amazing, like, I took notes while you were talking. It was really cool. I uh, had lots of insights. Thank you for that. Um, um, okay, so I like to start with a story. Just as a sapling needs water to grow into a fruit-bearing tree, similarly, your professional life, personal branding, to help you reap the fruits of your full potential. Today we will cover what is personal branding, why it is important, and how to do it. Personal branding is uh, beneficial regardless whether you're a celebrity or an entrepreneur or a corporate employee or an industry leader. Despite the common misconception, personal branding is not self-promotion. It is not about being famous or it is not about PR. It is not about creating a fake story that sells. Personal brand is your story and its perception. It is the art of telling your story in a way that adds some value in other people's lives. It is a part of you that you want the world to see and associate uh, you with. As human beings, we are prone to look at things that other people are looking at. A simple example is you're walking down the road and there's a crowd of people looking at something or someone. Even for a second, you just stop and you join them. Using the same principle back in the day, let's say Gandhi created his personal brand where he used to talk about his story and his vision to lots of people and then people went ahead and you know, spread his story. Creating a personal brand which was distinct. While everyone else was focusing more on the traditional way to do things, he accomplished the same thing by creating a very unique approach. Hence, his story is why we all know about. Thanks to social media, that we do not have to go door to door to spread our story. So social media platforms have made it very easy for people to share. But there's so much content out there that instead of shining, people are just being lost in the noise where everyone is just saying, look at me, look at me. So um, personal branding lets you break that noise. Think of it as your superpower that lets you manage people's perception. People have a narrative of you when they meet you. When you think they do not care or they do not know you, that's where you're wrong. If you do not talk about your story to them, 
then they have already created a story of you in their mind. Personal branding lets you control that narrative. Obviously, your story evolves as you grow, but the value of perception, that stays the same. To sum it up in one line, I would say that the personal branding is your art of storytelling, where you control the narrative. Let me give you an example of a founder who connected with his audience through his brand story. I worked with a hospitality company as a brand owner for three years, and the CEO has a very cool story. In India and throughout the world, there are many people who have founded and run hospitality companies. But what is the reason that this CEO seems to have a superpower of turning his brand from a small startup to the world's second largest hospitality company in five years? He became a face of a visionary. He became more recognized than the brand itself. That is because Ritesh Agarwal, the CEO and founder of Oil Hotels, has mastered the art of storytelling. He knows how to connect and inspire the audience. His story speaks authenticity and it is very easy to relate to. He hails from a small town, he dropped out of college, and because as a dropout, he wanted to travel around the country and he had a limited budget. And he found out that traveling in budget hotels or staying in budget hotels didn't provide even the basic amenities like Wi-Fi or clean washrooms or even clean linens. And that's when he went on the mission to provide budget hotels with essential. It was this vision and personal journey that inspired a lot of people to join in, to partner with him, invest in his company, and just like me, work with him to fulfill his dream of creating a perfect space. Even though the journey was started by a 19 year old boy with like little money, his vision wasn't compromised even after becoming a billionaire. As a result, creating a very powerful brand story by staying true to its original source. This story can play an important role in establishing and boosting your career. In fact, an overwhelming 85% of the hiring managers report that a job candidate's personal brand influences their hiring decision. So why do you invest in your personal brand? The answer is simple. It is to unlock your true potential. Let me break it down further. Point number one, it helps you stand out from the crowd. From a nobody, you become somebody. You may ask that isn't that just being famous? The answer is no. When you stand out from the crowd with your brand story, the objective is not to have, sorry, the objective is to have an influence over a large group of people that will listen to you. And you want them to listen to you because uh, according to cognitive bias, you tend to follow and agree with people that you know. For example, it could be your family, it could be your colleagues, it could be your mentor, or it could be an industry leader. Rather than just a stranger who's talking even more sense than others, but you will not listen to them. Hence the moment you break that noise and you become somebody, you instantly have an influence over the thoughts of a large group of people. Number two, that influence results into more access to opportunities. It gets you better job interviews. It gets you better partnerships, promotions, and investments. A strong brand can help you eliminate the competition. When your personal brand is distinct and unique, no one can beat you. Hence, getting you access to the wider range of opportunities that you didn't have before. More visible you are and the influence you have, more money you're going to attract. Your personal brand expedites the decision making and people would want to invest in you and your idea. According to the bandwagon effect, the tendency to do things because many other people are doing the same. The collective belief gets more possibility. It's like, if enough people are saying it, then it must be true. If enough people are doing it, then I should too. 
Hence, if an ABC investor gave you money, that means that I should too, thus creating a very quick decision bias in your favor. When you do your personal branding, it results into people thinking that they know you. It generates trust, it generates loyalty. People follow you, they want to work with you, and they want to buy whatever you're selling. They turn you into an industry leader because they relate to your story and they want to be a part of it. That way you will always be on the win. So let's revisit uh, the CEO story I just told you about. So how did his personal brand play a major role in making him a billionaire? He stood out with a story that helped solve a problem for others. He had access to opportunity due to the asset value of his personal brand. He had bigger investments because he became a household name. If, if five people were investing in his company or idea, there were more who followed. He became an industrial leader. He created a popular proof point of his vision, giving him a pre-existing loyal audience for any new future endeavor that he might undertake. Just because he built and executed his personal brand flawlessly, it gave him a leverage to meet his true potential. But let me tell you one more thing. It's not, the personal brand is not that you have to create everything from scratch. If you already have an existing brand, you can always reinvent it. It is not just limited to, I want to be popular. It is about how you can make money off it. How does it benefit you in your career? How does it benefit the stakeholder? I worked as a brand consultant for an architect, one of the nicest ones I have met. And although uh, he was quite well recognized in an architect community, he wanted to reinvent his personal brand and known for his passion of art and philanthropy. That is when I got on the mission to create a personal brand for him, uh, where he spoke of creativity and the sense of doing good in everything he touches. We organized an art show where we showcased the upcoming artists and any painting that was to be sold, the money was supposed to uh, co be contributed towards a foundation, a children's foundation. The, even the art installations has kids' pictures there. It was like a very, uh, let's say, comprehensive event which is no different for, from every other event that happens, obviously. The entire event was integrated on the concept of conscious art. Um, the first opening night, there were a lot of press, businessmen, influencers, art investors, uh, people who were invited there and we showcased this entire um, event to them. And then for the next two days, he opened the event for public viewing for free. We did nothing different from what other people do. We just had told his story in a way that made it different, and he stood up as a result. There is something called a framing effect. Framing effect is drawing different conclusions from the same information, depending on how that information is presented. Because we presented his story different from how other people do, he is now seen as a big philanthropist who raises millions by just one event, talking about his vision and good causes. He is now seen as an art enthusiast who provides platform for the new and upcoming artists. He is still seen as a kind and award-winning architect that designs sustainable structures. It became so successful and had such a big impact that instead of a one-time event, it became an and living and has been going on for the last four years. And the niche community actually looks forward to it every year. So now we have established that personal brand is the art of true storytelling. It established that you can become an industrial leader. It generates more money and it gets you more opportunity. Now let's talk about how to do personal branding. First, you understand your values. These are the things you believe in and are important to you. These are the core of who you are. It determines what kind of person and what are, what are your priorities. 
everything is built around it. Then identify your personality. These are the traits and the features you have, whether how agreeable you are, how extrovert or introvert or open-minded you are. Once you have more awareness about the different facets of your personality, you can decide how best to brand them and which one to brand them. Define your journey. Determine where you need to be. Your personal brand is more than a reflection of who you are today. It is a roadmap of where you want to go. By doing this, you will uncover the skills and traits that make you distinct, as well as the areas where you need to improve and gain new knowledge in order to advance forward. And the most important bit, define your audience. Your audience is the person who will pay you. The person who's going to influence the person who's going to pay you and your supporters. Think about when you're younger or when you're a kid and you want to go and hang out at a friend's place or there's a school trip. You make sure to get your request approved from your parents when they're in a good mood. This is the best example that teaches us an important lesson. It is best to invest your time and energy into an audience that is more likely to give you a desired outcome. Now you can create your personal brand story based on these four pillars of audience, personality, value, and journey. And just start spreading the world, word all over internet. Like you have way too many platforms for it. Go on Facebook, go on LinkedIn, go write blogs, like give interviews, and just spread the word. There are a few things to keep in mind when you're working on your personal brand though. Let's be honest with who you are and pick the traits that you want people to associate you with. Authenticity with real flaws, sorry, authenticity with flaws are much more appreciated by people than the fake perfect story. Do not say or talk about things that you cannot deliver, rather talk about the real qualities that you possess. Stay focused. When you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. If your message and story is not consistent, your audience will find it hard to connect with you. And that is the biggest mistake that everyone does because we all want our fingers in multiple jars, but that never ends well. Trust an expert. Remember to trust an expert's opinion and invest in yourself. Hats of how to get there quicker are never sustainable or an effective solution for it. So when I was in London in 2018, I met a lady, Claire. She runs a very successful blog with over 2 million subscribers. She told me a very interesting experience. She wanted to do personal branding, but didn't want to invest in it. So she asked her marketing team to work on the principles and build her personal brand. It started well, but as marketers do to gain more attraction, they kept tweaking her content to fit the story to meet the objective of the platform it was on. Despite the initial boost, she lost a big chunk of her audience. She came across as a confused person who doesn't know what she wants because she had to make so many different trade-offs to the story, she became inconsistent. People could not relate to her anymore. There is a difference between a personal branding and product branding or product marketing. Because when you brand yourself right, it is the competition that is irrelevant. Because the world is chaotic, either you can get lost in it or you break free and become relevant. Your personal brand is not what people talk to you about. It is what they talk about you when you leave the room. So it is best to be in control of your own narrative and tell a story that makes an impact for you, that works for you, and that benefits you. You need to create an identity. When you think Amazon, you think of Jeff Bezos. When you think of Apple, you think of Steve Jobs. 
Personal branding empowers you to stand out in your own chosen field. Because people do not do business with companies, they do business with people they like. Your goal is personal branding is to grow your tribe. That is by being consistent. People's attention span is very short these days and you need to narrow your audience. You need to capture their attention with each piece of content. And that only happens when you're consistent with your message and attitude. Do not think that personal brand is just online. It is offline. You have to embody your personal brand to create a loyal tribe that will stay with you forever. Be the best you. The personal branding process is quite simple, as you see, but it requires strategic thinking and a little bit of effort. You need to invest in yourself and reach a little higher. Get clarity on what your personal brand is. And you will see short-term and long-term results in your career and business. Keep in mind, you are not a product that needs to be marketed. You are a person with a story to tell. If you won't invest in your own brand, then why would others? So personal branding is not self-promotion. It is not marketing. It is not a sales pitch. It is just your story. And thank you so much um, for this lovely time. I hope this was helpful. Uh, this is really, really amazing, Chahat. I, I think you explained the brand in, in so many words, which I think uh, but eventually it drills down to few points which, which I have personally noted. And as I mentioned in your introduction, CISO role itself is where you need to build a brand, but eventually my, many times, as you mentioned, saying that you get lost in the noise. So, yeah. and for us, we have so much of noise, technology evolutions, data theft, you know, cyber attacks, you know, management reporting, the peer, peer uh, this thing. So I, I agree, you know, many people, they get lost in the noise and, you know, we probably uh, lose the focus. But just to summarize and which I have, I have noted few points is your ending statement is very good, right? There is a difference in marketing, personal branding, product branding and marketing. If it is a product, you can market, but you're a person, so you can't market, you don't want to market yourself because you're not so cheap, you're valuable. So you need to build your brand in a way that your, your personality itself, your name itself tells a story. Telling a story maybe in terms of what or maybe in terms of expressing your views or maybe in terms of, you know, your, your actions, right? So you itself, you know, tells a story to everybody else. Another thing is what you spoke about, which is very important is, and many times, and that was the basis for us to found this group was, you know, uh, the knowledge sharing. And that is how we are trying to build our elixir so as a brand. So we don't, we need not to market ourselves, our achievements. It has to be a real story. It has to be uh, trustworthy. It has to be authentic and it has to be engaging. Engaging means where, where people are really able to understand our thoughts and also complement those thoughts by putting their own because it's, the world is of knowledge sharing, right? So, so I think very, very well said. Another thing what I like is like when, when you start building a brand, okay, from nobody, you're moving to somebody, okay? And eventually that somebody can become your name itself, uh, you know, which, which talks about your brand. So, so that is very, very good. I think uh, it's, it's amazing for all of us. Another, the benefit also what you have mentioned about is that once you build a brand, you know, you don't have to really put efforts. People, you are able to influence people. You are able to, you know, put up your thought process uh, to, to any stakeholder, you know, maybe, maybe internal to company, you know, outsiders, to everybody. You are able to 
uh, put up your thought process and people are also looking out from your brand and the acceptance increases right so and it's easy to uh, you know expedit the decision making because people are building that trust so building trust building loyal loyalty influencing i think a lot i have noted so many things i think i don't want to repeat your your show session but i think we really got a good good way and good maybe a start to build our personal brand and i think you really touch a very very sensitive topic for all the ceos thank you so much Uh, for sharing your knowledge definitely over a period of so much time you would have developed this knowledge and shared it in few words that's also art you know which is which is amazing art thank you so much for this uh, i'm sure maybe i think we have exceeded exceeded 6 minutes but uh, if anybody would like to have some more question to chahat uh, i think uh, yeah So yes I see a question here um can all uh there's a difference between um personal branding and blowing your own trumpet um because I don't think it's 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 the story as long as your story is authentic and it is catered to the audience that you want to talk to because different people are going to react differently to your story so once you narrow down your audience and build your story for them that's when it becomes more of a storytelling and a personal brand rather than a trumpet i hope i answered that question yeah just to add to it maybe uh, the blowing the trumpet is the other person what you are thinking about it but uh, personal branding is not you know one event or two events or multiple events personal brand is being built over a period of time it's a long term strategy and not a short term strategy and when you and Agreed. as you mentioned in your this thing if you're realistic you're authentic uh, i think that becomes very easy to influence so whether the other person whether he's perceiving it as blowing a trumpet till the time you know that you're realistic and you're to the ground and focused about what you want to convey i think uh, long run people will understand that that's well it <laughs> yeah Yeah, thank you so much, Chahat. I think it was really wonderful to connect with you. Okay, there's one more question. If we can just take this as the last question, uh, because it's already we are seven minutes ahead. So if we can just take that question, and how do I know I my brand is based niche. within the brand marketing? Uh. so best is again very subjective you know that your brand is working when you start getting results let's say if your objective is to get more investment so you can measure it by how much investment uh, investment are you getting based on your brand story so remember i said that when you build your brand story you don't see now you see the future and you build for that future so if your end goal is let's say a promotion or becoming a ceo or becoming or starting your own company then your story needs to drive towards that particular goal you will see whether it's been successful or not just by seeing the results of that particular mission we cannot achieve everything by just one thing like you have to remain focused on what is the exact outcome that you want once you have that it is very easy to measure with each uh, mini goal i call it that you make to get to your bigger goal thank you so much chahat uh, neel and chahat i think it was wonderful thoughts uh, for all of us on behalf of village ciso community and all the participants i'd like to thank both of you to really take out time uh, late night and early morning for kelly uh, so so thank you so much for this and even for neel as well i think it's pretty early morning thank you so much for joining us thank you so much to all the participants to join us i hope that makes a difference in your life uh, maybe making a difference whoever has already started the journey to take it to a next milestone or maybe start a milestone it is never life is a journey and never a uh, uh, never a milestone so so keep going keep doing think long term maybe from technology perspective as well as brand perspective thank you so much and hope to see you i mean all, to all the participants hope to see you for the next webinar 
uh, next week. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks and Thank have a nice time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe.